Aspen High School um, chemistry class and River Watch team. I'll have them introduce themselves, but I'll just briefly tell you about the presentation they and their um, study. They did a data analysis, data and analysis regarding chemical changes from the headwaters to the mouth of the Rowing Fork River, and this is going to include information on pH, alkalinity, hardness, temperature, and dissolved oxygen. I uh, want well, each of you to who, um, introduce yourself and tell me what grade you're in. I'm Tatum Johnson, and I'm a sophomore. My name is Tilly Swanson. I'm a sophomore. I'm Spencer Burley. I'm a sophomore. I'm Kelly Francis. I'm a sophomore. I'm Capri Seaman. I'm a sophomore. Uh, I'm Jack. I'm a sophomore. <laughs> Jeremy. We're all sophomores. Thank you, Jack. So we are going to have to um, go ahead with your presentation. I'm sorry, you guys, that we can't get it on a larger format. Um, anybody else who's presenting in this room, please email me your presentation. It seems that my computer is the only one working. Um, so email address, ready, april.long at cityofaspen.com. Okay. Tilly, are you talking first? Yeah, yeah. All right, here you go. Okay, so our presentation is on the chemistry of the Roaring Fork watershed. We studied different locations of the watershed to see how the chemistry changed as the water slid down the valley. We started somewhere up here and ended around there. So, we'll start with the chemistry, our, what our watershed is and what all the tributaries look like, seeing how our watershed is affected by the different rivers that flow into it and what the rivers are. So, here's a map of our watershed. There are many different tributaries, with the main river being the Roaring Fork, and it's flowing into the Colorado. Now, some of the main tributaries are the Castle Creek, the Crystal River, and the Frying Pan. We took data from different points across the valley to see how the pH, alkalinity, hardness, and different elements changed as you went down the valley. We started up in the grottoes over here, went down through Slaughterhouse, Frying Pan, and ended in Glenwood, seeing how our water changed as it flew through the valley. So, what is, what is stream flow? That's our next topic. Stream flow is how fast the water is moving. How many cubic feet of water flow through a single point in the river in a second? Our, the stream flow changes greatly as we went through the valley. And we also studied this along with our other variables. David, thank you. No, wait, go back. There you go. I'm going to hand the mic off to David. So as you can see, we, can, we have a graph of the different locations along the valley. So down here it's starting up at the grottos, and as it moves down the valley, we can see that the stream flow increased a lot. This means that at the top of the valley, the water was pretty shallow and it was moving at a slow rate, and by the time all of the tributaries came in, it was moving much faster and much more water was flowing at once. I'm Spencer. So in conclusion, we found that when uh, so it's changed. Um, we asked so questions. As you go down the elevation, there's less stream flow, uh, which is because there's less tributaries adding to the stream flow, less more rivers that add to the, the main river the Roaring Fork. Uh, we found that throughout the 2018, there's less snowpack, so consequently, surprisingly, there's less water. Uh, the, uh, the less stream flow actually alters the chemistry of other parts like hardness, alkalinity in the water and that overall affects the quality, uh, quality and yes, that's mainly concentration of chemicals. Alright, so me and Kelly, we studied the sample location versus alkalinity and hardness. So we first researched um, what is hardness and what is alkalinity. Hardness is the total concentration of cations, which are positively, positively charged ions. It's specifically calcium and magnesium. Uh, we found that a high hardness in a river is better because it helps um, plants and animals in the river since it, calcium is a nutrient. And alkalinity measures the buffering capacity of water. It specifically protects the water from acids and neutralizes hydrogen ions. It uh, is caused by bicarbonate and carbonate ions. 
And then some of the influences of hardness and alkalinity is hardness is dissolved nutrients, which Kelly touched on, and calcium and magnesium. And it also has to do with geology, like a lot to do with like the rock structures around the river and such. And then alkalinity is the sediments in water, like limestone. Um, and then human activity plays a big role in alkalinity and pH. And alkalinity are related because alkalinity buffers the acids. And um, so we found we all we use the same data points that um, the previous group did for this dream flow. So for hardness, we found that it uh, it rose to it started at about like 130 milligrams per liter, and then it decreased to about 50, and then continued to increase as we went up the down the Roaring Fork River. So in conclusion for hardness, um, the water of the hardness decreases from the Grotto's Bridge, which was our first step, um, to the North Star, and then it increases as it moves farther down the stream because it obtains more nutrients. Um, and when the nutrients are released into the water, it helps a lot of the aquatic life because a lot of them need the nutrients. And so since the water of the hardness ranges from about 50 to 280 milliliters, the water is mostly like very good. So in our water system, it's high, which is, as we touched on before, it is good. And some of our further questions were, um, we were wondering why the water decreased all of a sudden from North Star. So we were wondering if we redid our samples, if we would get a different answer or the same answer. Okay, so this is our alkalinity data. And as you can see, the alkalinity slowly rises from the Grotto's Bridge downwards so or down our valley. Um, in conclusion, we also saw that it continued to increase throughout by going down the Roaring Fork River because um, it was exposed to more sediments, which was able to protect the river more than when it was, had, was at the Independence Pass site. Right? And we also saw that the total alkalinity increased, and when that happened, the phenolphthalene alkalinity also increased because the pH went above 8.3. and since the typical alkalinity level is about between 100 and 250 milligrams per liter, um, the alkalinity is not concerning from about Slaughterhouse Bridge to Glenwood because it was in that range, but the other locations are very close together and since they're not exposed to like human activity and are basically the start of the river, it's not that concerning that at the other sites they were lower than that since they weren't really exposed to any sediments. And future questions that we asked was what is the relationship between human activity and alkalinity? And do these results hold true if we took them at different times of the year or at different times of day? Okay. Hello. Uh, so another thing that our group studied was dissolved oxygen in the Roaring Fork River. And dissolved oxygen is the concentration of free oxygen, that's O2, that's uh, dissolved in a body of water. Uh, a whole bunch of things can affect it. That can be movement of water and turbulence. It can be photosynthesis, water temperature, the saltiness or the salinity of the water, and oxygen consuming biological life or chemicals, and also atmospheric pressure and elevation. And the reason why dissolved oxygen is so important in a water supply is because, much like humans, aquatic life needs oxygen too. Um, and it gets it in the form of dissolved oxygen. So any sort of big change to the, the dissolved oxygen of a river can also have a big impact on the aquatic life that's living in the river as well. Um, okay, so when dissolved oxygen gets lower, um, the amount of biodiversity within the river can actually be drastically lowered. So while there are some fish, like carp, that can survive in these really low oxygen environments, um, as it continues to lower, we're going to start seeing um, really low biological diversity and we're going to start losing some of those fish that we all enjoy like uh, trout and so I just have an image up here that shows some of the um, critical points where dissolved oxygen is important and what happens when it lowers. Um, really the big thing that we looked at as a group was dissolved oxygen and temperature because we expect to see when dissolved oxygen um, uh, when temperature rises, we expect to see that dissolved oxygen will lower, 
and this is because when um, water is hotter, it beat the atoms within it are more energetic, and this allows oxygen to actually um, escape and diffuse out of the body of water, which is bad. So um, that kind of brings up um, as our water as our water gets hotter, uh, we'll have less oxygen for our organisms. Okay, and then um, we also decided to look at dissolved oxygen versus river flow because another important relationship with dissolved oxygen is actually turbulence. And as water is more turbulent and spins around and um, you know is faster, it actually can catch more oxygen. And so we did take that data, but we actually didn't see any correlation. And you know. so a few things that we got from looking at our data is that one, uh, in general, the dissolved oxygen of the dissolved oxygen, of all the sort of tributaries in the Roaring Fork area. All of them have a dissolved oxygen of around 9 parts per million to around 10 parts per million. And that's good. That's around what you want uh, for aquatic life to survive and thrive in a river. However, one of the things that we were also thinking about is since temperature has a high correlation between, you know, the higher the temperature, the lower the dissolved oxygen, we were kind of wondering if for the future, maybe climate change, or the, the heating of the earth, and just even the Roaring Forks Valley in general, we were kind of wondering is if as that process went on, if we would see the dissolved oxygen areas in the Roaring Fork Valley, dissolved oxygen numbers in the Roaring Fork Valley lower, and then as a result, see aquatic life suffer. Hi, lovely people. So we're doing pH levels in the Roaring Fork Valley. I'm Emma, and I'm a sophomore. I'm Macy, and I'm a sophomore. I'm Carolina, and I am also a sophomore. And you all know Jeremy. What? So. Okay, so pH stands for percent hydrogen. So it measures the percentage of hydrogen plus ions in the water. And it's measured on a scale from 1 to 14, with 1 being acidic and 14 being basic, and then 7 being neutral. Um, and then each change in the scale is a tenfold change, so it changes by 10% each time. Um, so some of the things that can affect the pH levels in our river is the amount of bicarbonate ions that are present in the water, which, as we mentioned earlier, it helps to buffer out the amount of acidity, which keeps, um, keeps our water basic and healthy. Um, also, the type of rock or soil that is present both in and around the river can have an effect, and pollutants from farming or agriculture or big factories that get drained into the river, as well as car emissions, which can come into the atmosphere and thus make our rain and snow more acidic, which when it eventually comes down and gets into our river, will then lower the pH. Um, as well as carbon dioxide levels, if we have a higher percentage of carbon dioxide, that tends to make the pH a little bit more acidic, and if we have a lower percentage, it tends to make it a little bit more basic. So here is our data. So the Colorado standard for pH is 6.5 to 9 when you measure it, so that means you have a healthy river. So our data is in that range. The grottos and down in Glenwood have the, have the most acidic pH, and we think that in the grottos it is so acidic because of like the soil or some of the rocks. And up in Glenwood, we think it's either like the car pollutions because they're near a major highway, but also we think some of the tributaries that go into the river at, like help with this, so that's why it's more safe. <laughs> yeah, so some conclusions that we gathered, gathered from this, Emma already spoke about a few of them. Um, for one, pH levels from the Roaring Fork Valley range from around 7.88 to 7.48, which is, that's totally great. It's right within the Colorado State Standard. The average is around 7.69. So that means that each tributary is of acceptable quality, and that means that each the rivers is probably pretty suitable for animals, for aquatic life. Um, so looking ahead, a few other conclusions that we could try and draw from this and a few places where we could, that we could move with this information. Uh, we noticed that West Bank and Grottos were the two most acidic of all of the tributaries, which we thought was interesting because they're on opposite sides of the Roaring Fork Valley. So we figured that that was probably, um, the, the acidity, Emma said, we figured maybe in 
grottos could come from something like soil, acidity of soil, and maybe closer to West Bank it would come from car pollution, from as, as people go down Highway 82. Um, then we also noticed that the Heron Park sample, which is right in the center of Aspen, um, was a little more basic than all the other samples. Again, all of the samples are semi-pretty similar, just because, and that's to be expected, because they all flow into the same river. It's all the surrounding area. Um, yeah, all the pHs were fairly similar, but Heron Park was just a little more basic, so we think maybe that's something to investigate. And then another thing that we were thinking is maybe one of the reasons why West Bank was more acidic uh, than the other rivers is potentially because of the Crystal River, which goes right into it. So we're thinking maybe, maybe it's something to do with the acidity of the Crystal River that's affecting that as well. So I think, I think we're ready for questions. I think that's all, all the information we have. Could the grottos be more acidic because of the mining coming out of Grizzly up there? Would, do you think that could affect it? That's actually a really good idea. We didn't think of that. Yes, that's, that's definitely a potential option. Also, I might pass this off to any of you guys if any of you want to answer questions or any of you think you can yeah, we're all answer questions <laughs> better than I can. Well, how did you measure the, the level of oxygen in the river? So basically with all of our um, measurements that we got, we used um, titration. And the specific form of titration that we used was the, was the Winkler titration to measure the amount of dissolved oxygen. And it's actually a little bit of a, a process to get it. Because first you have to um, get the oxygen trapped in the water, which requires a series of chemical reactions that we bring with us to the site that we're actually taking it. And that can hold the oxygen in the bottle of water for about six hours. And then during that time, we then use, um, I forget, I think it's, it's uh, some form of acid to um, measure the amount of milligrams of acid that we have to put into the oxygen. And that in turn will produce a color change. And then we then find out how much milligrams of dissolved oxygen. By the color change? Yeah. So if, and you, you just noted that it seemed to be pretty equal throughout your measuring spots, but... Um, one thought too is just as the gradient is steeper, you're going to get more turbulence or more rapids that has an op opportunity to capture oxygen. But then that's probably carrying that oxygen downstream with it, right? Uh, yeah. Um, so I'd just be curious also if you went instead of like 20 miles downstream, if you went 200 miles downstream, maybe it just wasn't enough of a length of river to really show you. Um, yeah, that's one thing that we actually really wanted to do is we only got. Uh, a good seven points of data. And one of the things, at least for our presentation, is we were really hoping to get more, but unfortunately we just didn't have time yeah. to really get it. It's cool. We also collected all of our data within a two-day span to make sure that it was all very, that the time was not much of a factor. So within two days we could, and within our school hours, we could only really get a few places. Right. Like a couple of us went to the grottos after school and it still took a lot of time, so we were not actually able to move very far down the valley. Cool. Any other questions? So I love that you guys are sharing the data with us. Are you? Do you have any other plans of sharing the data or talking to uh, experts in the field locally? Yeah, we submit we submit our data to the Colorado to a Colorado database. So that a bunch of high schools throughout Colorado submit their river data and it can be used by different universities and the government to track the health of the rivers. Is this, is this River Watch of Colorado? Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you. Let's give these guys a round of applause.